digital economy an opportunity for an opportunity for decent work and economic growth I, I would first of all i would like to thank you for all to joining us in this session so uh, today with us we have mr harun sharif uh, as a chair of for this session mr harun sharif served as the minister for state and chairman of pakistan board of investment in 2018 and 19 in his capacity as a senior member of the economic team of the prime minister he actively contributed to major decision taken by the economic co co coordination committee of the cabinet and the cabinet committee on privatization he was pakistan's lead representative in the joint cooperation committee of the china pakistan economic corridor he championed various reforms of improving the ease of doing business setting up specialized economic zones and facilitating foreign direct investment from china the arabian gulf and the east asia he was also a member of the pakistan tourism board and high level task force then for special remarks we have with us mr parvez iftikhar he will be joining us shortly mr parvez iftikhar is the ceo of information communication technology forum for pakistan he is also a member of prime minister task force on information technology earlier as the country head of siemens telecom he acquired and executed multi million project which also involved technological transfer then we have mr jahanzeb khan the deputy chairman of planning commission pakistan mr jahanzeb khan has held dual charge of previously he has held a dual charge of chairman planning and development and additional chief secretary energy government in government of punjab he held various position in government and and has 24 year of diversified professional experience his professional expertise include public sector finance management he is also the deputy chairman planning and development board government government of punjab then in uh, then in speakers we have with us mr rabia tabassum the senior research associate at sdpi she has a work experience of over 6 year with the ministry of finance as well as in sdpi her research areas include education gender budget analysis digital trade and e-commerce e public finance management and data on sdg then we have mr then we have dr krishma banga she is an economist with focus on international trade digitalization and development she work as research fellow in the digital and technological cluster at ids uk she is also a visiting research fellow at center for trade economic integration graduate institute geneva and doctoral research at global development institute university of manchester under the sporting economic transformation program krishma's work focus on the digital economy and the future of the manufacturing led development models her research interest include international trade global value chain and foreign direct investment then we have mr uh, dr arslan tariq rana he is currently appointed as assistant professor of university of central punjab lahore before joining the university of central punjab lahore he worked as an assistant professor and head of economic cluster at fast school of management sciences he also worked as assistant lecturer and research fellow at university of orleans france and taught economics courses at master and undergraduate level then we have miss louis tiffany miss tiffany is social affairs officer of escape sub regional officer of south and south west asia where she managed and developed of its social development portfolio before her assign assignment to south asia she coordinated escape portfolio on employment and social protection for persons with disability at escapes social development division in bangkok she was also former education specialist at unesco in the in myanmar where she provided technical assistance to the government in sector wide education policy and planning and tvet uh, i think uh, after brief introduction of the panelists may i request the chair to please take up the session and uh, invite panelists for uh, their remarks thank you very much for the introduction warm welcome to participants and speakers uh, to this important session at the sustainable development conference and that as the topic says you know uh, uh, looking at the digital economy as a tool for growth and post pandemic growth is one of the very pertinent subjects uh, uh, which you know people have been talking i have been personally involved when i was part of the cabinet but then later on 
uh, when I looked at it, <clears throat> so three, four thoughts just to set the stage. I think most of the innovation comes from small and medium-sized companies in the digital space. And uh, what we have seen in Pakistan is that number of services in addition to e-commerce have been introduced on health and education and cash transfers uh, uh, using the digital technology platform. So it will be nice to uh, you know, see what's happening across the globe through researchers. Uh, one of the things which Asia has done, particularly countries like Singapore and India and others, uh, uh, moved the whole investment in skills uh, towards, you know, this uh, uh, more digital technology from, you know, the efficiency-based skills to knowledge-based skills. So that's a trend which is linked to future of jobs, decent employment, and, you know, countries with higher population like Pakistan needs to have policy interventions uh, to have the skill base. I was told yesterday that Pakistan produces only 30,000 graduates in the digital space. And out of them, you know, mostly around 20% are of the world standard. So more investments are needed, you know, in this particular site. And one of the areas which, you know, as we expand is how to reach out to marginalized, uh, you know, areas of the country. So that needs infrastructure. But lastly, I would say that while we talk about the, you know, uh, fintechs and startups and others, uh, consumers are quite concerned about cybersecurity as well. So that is something the regulatory frameworks have to respond effectively uh, uh, in this world of connectivity through digitalization. So I look forward to hearing from the worthy panelists today. So with that, I think our first speaker is Mr. Pervez Iftikhar, who's been introduced. So uh, uh, we have around 10 minutes uh, uh, for your uh, keynote thoughts to set the stage. You are on mute. Just realized. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, thank you very much, Harun Saab, and the rest of the panelists and other participants. Uh, this topic, is, uh, topic, of course, is extremely pertinent. Uh, the pandemic uh, through which we are still passing, uh, it's not over yet, uh, was and is indeed an opportunity too uh, for, for, for digital economy. Uh, but unfortunately, opportunities themselves do not yield any benefits uh, unless properly exploited. And sadly, in our uh, beloved Pakistan, the opportunity of, uh, offered by pandemic uh, in the digital space, uh, in my opinion, has not been fully utilized. And I will confine myself to um, my uh, own um, domain uh, where I have uh, some expertise and some experience, and that is telecommunications. Now, telecommunications is basically the, the foundation on which everything runs. The internet runs on, on in telecom, telecommunications infrastructure, and unless uh, that infrastructure is there uh, uh, of proper quality and proper uh, standard, uh, neither the SMEs can be reached, uh, help the chode, you can't even connect with them, uh, you can't uh, develop skills remotely, you cannot work remotely, you cannot uh, have fintechs and startups and all that. These are all the things that internet ki hai. Aur internet needs infrastructure. Uh, so unless they, uh, everybody is connected digitally, Digital economy doesn't work. So my basics start from there. So uh, digital infrastructure, let us have a look at a, at a, at a global uh, look at it from uh, uh, at, at the Pakistani infrastructure. A report is UN Department of uh, Economic and Social Affairs ki 2020 ki report hai, which looks at the infrastructure, telecommunication infrastructure of 192 countries it places Pakistan at 164th position. Uh, not a very, uh, not just it's not, uh, it's not very uh, enticing. It is, uh, it places that behind all our neighbors except Afghanistan. So everybody else is above the position number 164. Uh, similarly, there is a network readiness index 2021, which is released just last week. 
it places Pakistan as 97th position out of 130 countries. Uh, again, behind most of our neighbors. I think Nepal is not as, Nepal and Afghanistan are exceptions. So what, what, what is the problem? Where does the problem lie? Well, there are two uh, basic things. Again, basics can be basics. Infrastructure may wired infrastructure hai, just made optic fiber cables hai, or wireless infrastructure that you spectrum per run karta hai. Optic fiber cables penetration amari jo hai, wo iski, wo bhi, again is one of the lowest in the region. Uh, Thailand may, for example, 90% of the mobile towers which deliver internet to the people basically predominantly hamare haan, internet is uh, accessed uh, wirelessly over mobile smartphones. And uh, uh, there are uh, uh, about out of 109 million uh, broadband subscriptions in Pakistan, 106 million are mobile. So uh, for that, you need to connect uh, the, uh, the towers with optic fiber cables. Now, Thailand has 90% of the towers connected with optic fiber cables, just for comparison. Malaysia is 50%, India 39%, Bangladesh 27%. Uh, Pakistan may we have about 10% mobile towers which are connected with optic fiber cables. So when optic fiber cable connectivity is not so pathetic internet, pathetic 4, 4G aata hai, except for uh, big cities and uh, will be affluent areas of big cities, you know how the position of internet is. Uh, so that is the, the, the vehicle on which the digital uh, economy has to work. Uh, and there is no effort which is visible at this point in time where uh, the optic fiber investors are being incentivized. Let's come to the spectrum, the wireless part. Uh, the spectrum, you know, allocate the government or, uh, or, or, or uh, once it releases spectrum, it is allocated by auction, spectrum auction. So uh, the spectrum which is allocated in Pakistan to wireless uh, operators, mainly mobile hai wo, uh, is less than all regional countries, including Afghanistan. So that is the, that is the spectrum position. So uh, government uh, release karti hai aur auction karti hai Pakistan mein, first of all, to release hi nahi hota uh, for, for, for years or half a decade or decades sometimes. Or if release hota hai, it is, uh, it is, uh, it has very extremely tough conditions attached to it, and the price, the base price hai, auction ki, you know, ki se auction start hota hai, it is extremely high, or uh, 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 uske wo operators find don't find a business case. Uh, being from in the private sector, they know they have to see the business case. Consequently, the last spectrum option, which was held just a couple of months ago. Uh, there was only one extremely desperate uh, service provider who purchased about one third of the spectrum. Two third went unsold. So uh, the, the, basically the spectrum auction failed miserably. So because there is an overemphasis in upfront money, kitna paisa kama sakte hai, kitna hum government ke liye, ke liye hum, uh, la sakte hai, uh, flag raise kar sakte hai, we brought so much money. Those long-term benefits in the digital economy, pe, they are absolutely ignored. And uh, uh, therefore, you know, this opportunity that we're talking about, it cannot be, it cannot be encashed. Uh, so these are some of the thoughts as, as far as I'm concerned from the, from the basics. Uh, digital economy needs a fantastic, if not <laughs> the best in, uh, infrastructure uh, to run. And that is what we lack in Pakistan. Thank you very much. So I guess you are on mute now. Yeah. Okay. So now you can hear me, I guess. So I think, thank you very much for your thoughts. I think the messages are clear that if one country like Pakistan has to leverage this opportunity, uh, you know, you do, do not only need to invest in the sporting digital infrastructure, like you mentioned, the optic fibers and incentives, but also to take a little medium to longer term view of the trade-off rather than looking for immediate financial gains through the providers. 
So I think these are some of the things which needs to be seen in the regional context that how countries have done it so that you know the Pakistani policymakers can be better informed. Uh, I do <clears throat> uh, uh, agree with you on one part that the short-term reactive approach uh, does not really work because you need to take a much wider approach. So with just that, to add, I think we, yeah. Just to add that short-term gain actually disappears very quickly in the budget deficit. I totally agree in a country which is in a, you know, perpetual uh, uh, fiscal pressure. So these things are not necessarily translated into, even if you get the money, it's not reinvested in the digital infrastructure. So these are some of the weaknesses or fault lines uh, where Pakistan has shown some progress, but not necessarily uh, what is the potential there lies uh, uh, in the digital space. So with that, I think from the government side, we have a recorded message <clears throat> from Jahanzeb Khan, who is head of the planning commission. So let's hear that uh, what government has passed on and then we can move on. The Avas, are you running it? Yes, sir. Thank you very much for this invitation to participate in the Sustainable Development Conference, the 25th one being organized by SDPI, and I think this is landmark. It comes at a very, very important time when we are looking at uh, so many things which are coinciding in the uh, impact of COVID, which is still ongoing. And we also have the challenges to the economy, the IMF program. And this huge transformation that has happened worldwide due to COVID, particularly on digital um, economy. So this topic is very topical, and I'm sure that your deliberations and your work would uh, bring forward on how to move on this very important agenda. Um, I think all of us know, and there's no need to stress this again, but how digital revolution has really transformed uh, in the last few years, decades, and it has had an exponential impact on human and economic activity. It is one of the biggest drivers of transformation in all areas, the way in which humanity works, whether it's work, uh, learning, lives, or interaction with other people. Now, a lot of countries are scrambling, some are ahead of uh, others, but they are looking at how to, to meet the challenges of this new era. Uh, Pakistan has been also trying to, to get benefits of this digital economy and digital Pakistan has um, achieved some strides. Uh, the cellular density has increased from some 9% to 85% and uh, that's a, a big plus. Uh, we've also been able to have uh, 3G and 4G broadband services uh, subscribers have increased from 81 million to 98, almost 100 million. There's several uh, projects in the PSDP which are together known as the Knowledge Economy Projects. Uh, these are trying to upgrade uh, the critical areas of gap where um, we need to invest more. We have universities, we have uh, research institutions but to network them in a way that they complement each other and reinforce the work that has been going on there. Now, I would not like to burden you with the numbers. I think um, it's very informed gathering. We all know the numbers, how the trading service is increasing. Only between 2005 and 17, it grew by 5% per year on average. And uh, the WTO global trade model also indicates that the global share of services could increase by 50% uh, by 2040. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, we, the ecosystem for startups in Pakistan and um, how entrepreneurship can be uh, promoted, which can lead to harness this potential, which is clearly on the horizon and is as well understood and documented. Um, again, these are important points, but uh, uh, well known that the number of high um, youth which is unemployed, the, the labor market, 
our growing number of young Pakistanis are entering it, but they don't have uh, optimal opportunities of uh, livelihoods. And how tech-savvy Pakistanis can really participate in this new uh, national and global economy and, and benefit it from their persons and as well as for the country. Now, what are, what are the challenges that uh, are before us? Uh, we've made this investment in in many uh, training institutions, uh, universities, uh, various uh, institutions to develop ICT. Uh, but there are several challenges. And the first one in my mind is that there would be significant disruptions in the labor market and we should be prepared for this because this new economy would create new opportunities uh, which would be distinctly different from the ones that um, you know, have been there in the, in the existing economy and this would require a transition and it has to be uh, managed in, in a more <coughs> uh, planned way so that we move from both low and high end, uh, from low to high end jobs and from routine occupations to things that add more value. The employment opportunities in the new digital economy uh, are going to be available to the more marginalized areas in terms of the global outlook to the south but within Pakistan also to areas which are underdeveloped and that will require upgrading the digital infrastructure, uh, the teledensity, the ability of uh, young boys and girls, men and women in these areas to be able to access uh, internet but also to have reliable electricity and the technical infrastructure, the broadband telecommunication, so that they can participate in this new global economy. Uh, low level of ICT infrastructure uh, would create a more and more digital divide if, if we would not um, address that in time. And poor quality of information over all e-government platforms. Uh, this would also have a bearing on how we can take full benefits of this. Uh, sound privacy information security policies and systems and regulatory institutions are again something which are prerequisites to fully benefit from this new economy, if I may call it that. Uh, but alongside the cultural shift and the behavioral change to use technology and e-government as a major uh, dispenser of services where so the citizens can engage with the government uh, with ease, with transparency, and with low costs associated with that. I have mentioned the legal and the regulatory environment, but I'd like to re-emphasize on that, and I think there's a lot of work to be done on that. The environmental context in terms of accepting new technologies and uh, also um, providing the, the basic knowledge, and education, and curiosity, and innovation, and the ability to uh, to have to participate in it is also very important. This would require um, a complete look at the environment in which uh, the culture, the social structure, language, economic, and political ideology all have a role to play. Uh, fostering new economic activities enabled by digital technology is crucial to generate and create more jobs. And for that, investment in data and data infrastructure is essential to support innovation, growth, and jobs in the digital economy. Uh, for workers, this would also mean greater flexibility, the existing regulations, uh, the work uh, protocols will have to be need changed. And this in particular provides a huge opportunity for us to, to bridge it, to narrow if not to bridge the gender gap uh, because uh, the female participation in the digital economy is much more flexible. Uh, it uh, mitigates against some of those issues that they face uh, in terms of mobility, in terms of uh, the hours that they can work and to uh, give them a better opportunity in that. Uh, the government is committed to this. Uh, we are spending a great deal of uh, public investment in this. Uh, a lot of um, IT investments have led to training of professionals, blended virtual education, the cellular coverage has been increased, in particularly in areas 
uh, where there was previously uh, less <coughs> coverage intensity. In particular, I should mention Gilbert Pakistan and Azad Jammu in Kashmir. Uh, we are also uh, working on specialized technology parks, and these are also on the offing. Uh, there are a number of scholarships, uh, training opportunities that are available. The State Bank of Pakistan has taken leadership on allowing the Russian digital accounts and digitization of banking services. There are some good strides have been made. Uh, similarly, the FBR has has digitized many of its services and that would lead to greater and better tax collection. The citizens portal is also an important way of engagement for the citizens of the government and a lot of public uh, complaints and issues are being redressed from this. Um, a lot of work is also going on in digitization of land record and the digitization of um, urban property, motor vehicle, uh, a lot of these digital data are available, but I think the challenge lies in, in uh, these data sets to be able to speak to each other and how to uh, leverage data for better uh, public policy and implementation. Uh, SMEs would be significant contributors to Pakistan's economy and therefore helping them have uh, access to technology to be able to use technology for marketing their products and services will be extremely important. Uh, congratulations, STPI. This is an important topic, and we are here to support you. I shall be looking forward to the outcomes of these proceedings and see how we can benefit from it in preparing our uh, interventions, in particular, Budget 22 23. Thank you. So we heard from the uh, representative of the government, Deputy Chairman of Planning Commission. My impression from his discussion is that government has an understanding of the opportunity, uh, but still any concrete transformational policy shifts are not really visible. Uh, it's more of a facilitative mode that, you know, we have opened up the banking sector, we are there to help you out. But I think as mentioned by uh, 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 Sub, the issue is that if you need to leverage, you really need to come up with a very clear financial and policy support uh, and visibly implement it uh, so that you can reap. So with that, now we will move to our first panelist, Rabiat Bassum, and she will be speaking, I understand, about small and medium enterprises Nexus with digital economy. Uh, I would be keen to hear if there is some data or information in terms of availability of venture capital support, risk capital, and also, you know, uh, 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 the informal SMEs, how can they participate? One of the things I would highlight, which Deputy Chairman mentioned, this new intervention in Pakistan, which is Science and Technology Zones Authority. So is that an authority also looking at SMEs? So these are some of the questions for the next. So over to you. D. Rabia, if yes, you could yes, start. Sir. Yes. Um, thank you, uh, esteemed chair, for giving me this opportunity to speak on e-commerce uh, with the perspective of SMEs in uh, Pakistan. Um, I will start uh, with the key question uh, to why I discuss e-commerce, uh, particularly for Pakistan. Um, it is an emerging policy concern for Pakistan. Uh, particularly after COVID-19 and uh, its uh, growing policy interest as uh, in the form we have uh, e-commerce e policy of Pakistan uh, that was uh, launched in 2019 by Ministry of Commerce and we have proposed Pakistan ESME uh, program under uh, e-commerce policy and definitely we have digital Pakistan policy uh, back in 2018 by Ministry of IT and Telecom and uh, there is uh, another um, 
development on the institutional side uh, that is the development of national e-commerce council uh, and recent appointment of special assistant to uh, prime minister on e-commerce and recently he has announced the first e-commerce university so these are the recent uh, development that uh, i thought that should be uh, i should uh, mention here and other relevant bodies for example prime minister's uh, task force on uh, it and uh, telecom um Another reason uh, is the evolving digital landscape um, in Pakistan uh, that uh, implies that the increased likelihood to benefit from e-trade. Um, uh, as you can see, advancement in telecom uh, sector of Pakistan in the form of uh, 3G and 4G in, back in 2014, like uh, mentioned by the Dr. Jahan Zeb Khan as well. And uh, recently, uh, it is announced that 5G will also be launched soon in Pakistan that will open up a new um, era of uh, modern telecom in Pakistan. And due to um, that, uh, there is increase in broadband uh, subscribers from 2% to 30% within five years. And we have 89% increase in uh, e-commerce transactions within two years. There is market potential of e-commerce in Pakistan. Um, Pakistan is the 46th largest e-commerce market. Pakistan's e-commerce market size observed 35% growth in first quarter, quarter of uh, this fiscal year and annual growth rate of 7.5% uh, with the expected market, market value of uh, 7,000 um, million uh, US dollars uh, that we are expecting to have by 2025. And there's 92% over, uh, year uh, over year growth in, in e-commerce industry. Um, uh, reported by the Karachi Chamber of Commerce and Industry, uh, and 93.7% growth in digital payments. Uh, and according to another report of KCCI, uh, the RAS, that is an online marketplace, alone can create 1 million direct and indirect jobs by 2022. So um, there is a significance of e-commerce for SMEs. Um, uh, uh, digital technologies in SMEs has uh, potential to reduce the cost, increase productivity, and uh, definitely employ, uh, employment creation opportunities as well. Uh, currently, SME sector uh, employs 80% um, of the non-agricultural labor force, 25% um, share in manufactured goods exports, and uh, also contribute 30% in GDP, and th there is estimates that 40% uh, uh, of GDP that SME contributes uh, in Pakistan. Um, and government of Pakistan also set the target uh, under uh, uh, the e-commerce uh, policy of 2029 to raise e-commerce exports by 50% along with the facilitating small and medium uh, enterprises through uh, ESME initiative. So here you can see um, the e-commerce structure in Pakistan um, that is uh, broadly categorized as um, business to customers, online marketplaces for goods and services. Um, uh, they, they, uh, along with the uh, market potential and some uh, policy and uh, digital uh, emerging landscape, uh, there are certain limitations. Uh, to promote uh, e-commerce in Pakistan um, and lack of knowledge of technologies is uh, one of them uh, that exist um, at the SME's level and they, uh, as reported in the literature. Uh, so um, there are financial constraints uh, to adopt e-commerce um, by, e uh, by the SMEs. And uh, certainly there are, there are e-payment uh, issues. Uh, mostly uh, smaller entities uh, face this difficulty uh, of um, connection with the international payment infrastructure uh, because they have strict uh, online uh, merchant uh, uh, onboarding criteria. That's why they face exclusion from the international payment uh, infrastructure. And there is an availability of international payment schemes like PayPal. Um, and apart from these, uh, there is logistic uh, uh, issues uh, uh, to adopt uh, e-commerce e by SMEs, and these include coverage um, and uh, as, as also pro uh, product damages. Um, 
capacity issues are one of the most important uh, issue that is uh, widely reported in the literature um, by the SMEs. Uh, they need capacity uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, developing websites, uh, digital, particularly digital marketing and logistics as well. Uh, so there is tax burden on ICT products and internet use as well that uh, that uh, put certain limitations to easily adopt e-commerce and there is absence of data protection uh, law that resulted in cyber crimes and uh, consumer protection as mentioned by the Parvez Iftakar sub as well and uh, by share that is another concern uh, that uh, leads to uh, towards declining trust of the consumers and uh, last but not the least lack of access to feasible internet uh, like uh, broadly uh, elaborated by the uh, uh, Mr. Pervasive Tehar Saab and also the digital divide in Pakistan um, that is a major factor uh, needs to be addressed to promote inclusiveness. And from now I will, that's it from my side. Thank you. Thank you very much Rabia for giving us an overview. So one thing looks good that number of transactions in the e-commerce space are rising uh, with the data which you have shown. But at the same time, it's also good to note that there's an e-commerce policy formally now approved by the government. So there is a framework available. Uh, the questions for you know, the panel and the participants is that how to operationalize this policy uh, as you have yourself mentioned, the gaps of infrastructure, the gaps of skills, and, you know, so one needs to, uh, there has to be a holistic coordinated effort, but at least the trend is clear that the transactions are rising, be it financial, be it trade, uh, and SMEs are looking forward to incentives which are needed to uh, uh, further gain from that. And I, I, as I mentioned, that SMEs will not only create jobs, but also most of the innovations actually take place in the SME sector. And I hope that like, you know, India has done other countries that Pakistan's exports, which are knowledge-based products uh, are coming into the export mix in future because that's where value addition and fast track growth is envisaged. So with that, we have our next speaker from UNSCAP. And I hope to get you know, a view of the region because UNSCAP works in multiple countries in Asia. So I would like to pass on uh, now the presentation time of 10 minutes uh, as per the other uh, participant to uh, uh, Ms. Lee Stephanie Chu, uh, which is a social, who is the social affairs officer at UNSCAP. Uh, we would like to hear the view from uh, uh, that side. And particularly, I'm keen to learn what's happening in East Asia. Hey, uh, thank you very much, sir. Um, first, perhaps, uh, would, would I be expected to share the screen? Or, because I sent the PPT to the organizers, or should I share it from my end? Whatever you online. prefer, whatever you prefer. If you like to share by yourself, then we will give you the uh, maybe, screen maybe sharing rights. Maybe you could help me share it because I'm not so familiar with Zoom. We work more on Microsoft Teams. If you know, already oh. have Stephanie's presentation, please run it. Yeah. Okay, so um, I think first I'd like to uh, say a very good afternoon from ESCAP to all the distinguished uh, speakers and panel members uh, today. And I'd like to thank the organizers uh, for inviting us uh, to this panel. Um, for my presentation, I would actually focus on providing an economic argument uh, as to why we should ensure that women and girls are not left out of the digital economy uh, in Pakistan. And then I would also provide uh, suggestions on um, how we could close the gender gap. So my presentation will be divided into three parts. The first provides uh, an overview of the state of women's economic empowerment in Pakistan. Um, and the second one would discuss uh, the role of digital inclusion as an enabler for women's economic uh, empowerment. 
and also provide some proposals uh, on how we could actually enhance the digital inclusion of women. And then finally, I would like to share a little bit about the uh, SCAP's current and upcoming support on empowering women for the digital economy. Uh, sorry, could we just uh, go to the second slide for now? Yes, I'll, I'll let you know when it's uh, the next slide. Okay, so um, I understand that uh, maybe there, there is some uh, expectation of a discussion on uh, what's happening in East Asia. Um, I think maybe later during the open discussion, I could share a little bit more uh, on that since my PowerPoint presentation at this moment focuses a little bit more on uh, the Pakistan context. Yeah, so um, I just wanted to share some standard employment related indicators um, and, you know, to basically present uh, the case that there is a clear gender gap. Um, as, as we can see, right, uh, be it in terms of labor force participation rate, employment to population ratio of women in managerial positions. Now, um, one good news, however, is that uh, when we look at the labor force survey from 2009 to 2018, we see that uh, the percentage of uh, women in managerial positions have actually increased uh, from 2.9. Uh, to 4.9. So um, while this is still, you know, a relatively low percentage, but I would say that uh, when we look at the extent to which uh, it has increased, I, I would say that uh, that is some good news. And hopefully, um, you know, in the digital sphere, um, through some policy interventions, we could further facilitate uh, more women in managerial positions. Okay, um, next slide, please. Okay, so then now I also like to share um, some other data sets because uh, we do see the same trend. So uh, previously the data set was actually from ILO stat. So this is a United Nations uh, database. Now I'd like to show you some analysis from the private sector. So this is uh, from uh, McKinsey Institute uh, that uh, they had done in 2018. Um, showing this extent of gender equality in various uh, Asia Pacific countries. Um, and I'd like uh, for us to focus on uh, the first two scores, uh, because this is most relevant for our discussion, one on work and one on essential services and enablers of uh, economic opportunity. So when we look at uh, the scores, um, you know, and, and when, when the PowerPoint is being shared, then I, I think, you know, you could actually take a closer look at uh, the exact numbers. But we do see that uh, the scores are indeed a little bit worrying. Uh, even when we are comparing uh, just to our neighbours uh, in South Asia. Yeah? Um, we see in terms of uh, the indicators on work, actually, I think Pakistan um, is, uh, is, is uh, the lowest and uh, across Asia and the Pacific. And when we look at uh, indicators on essential services and enablers of economic opportunity, um, Pakistan's not doing too badly. Uh, across the region, but among our neighbours, uh, I believe we are the second most. So, um, in, in this, I wanted to set out this context and then talk about why digital inclusion uh, is important. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so now, um, I guess the question um, that uh, the economists in this panel, uh, which is basically um, the rest of you would ask is, well, why would this be important? Um, and one very important economic argument is uh, because of the potential um, of, uh, you know, ensuring the economic potential of actually ensuring uh, gender equality. We see that uh, this has the potential of actually um, adding 30 billion to the annual GDP or 7% um, above uh, what's the current GDP rate. And uh, if we look at the table, um, we see that actually the female share for GDP in Pakistan is actually um, the lowest in the list of countries compared. Um, when I did the screen capture, I just uh, cut it, but there are several other countries uh, below. Uh, so we see that uh, right now, the figure for Pakistan, we are looking at like only about 11% of uh, female contribution to the GDP. So we see that there's a lot of potential to actually, you know, so if more women contribute to the GDP by going out to work, by um, being entrepreneurs uh, through digital inclusion, then we can see that uh, the GDP also has a lot of uh, upward moving scope. Yeah. Uh, next slide, please. So now finally, we come into uh, the main point, which is, uh, you know, uh, that digital inclusion uh, would be an important means 
to facilitate uh, such uh, female participation in the economy and thereby also facilitate uh, economic development. Um, I think I need not uh, belabor the point about how digital inclusion is an enabler because uh, you know, we are speaking among experts, you know, uh, be it uh, an enabler for access to financial services, jobs, markets and revenue opportunities, education, health and other basic services. And I think that the, the speakers before me have already mentioned about how you know, through um, digitalization, we can actually um, you know, um, shorten distances and enable more women to go out to work. Now, um, apart from what has been known all along, I think the opportunity right now actually um, is a very unique one uh, as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and we have seen uh, through research that uh, there are increased jobs and business opportunities uh, that will be digital related and digital enabled. So I would urge uh, the policymakers uh, who are present today in our panel um, to actually take note of this and uh, of this window of opportunity and for us to capitalize this um, and to ensure gender inclusion in uh, the digital economy. Um, next slide, please. Okay, then I'd like now to actually um, share a little bit about uh, the data on basically um, some of the access matrices in terms of digital inclusion. So um, we can see on our uh, left side that uh, there is a clear gender gap. Um, we, we see some selection of countries and this is from a recently published uh, World Bank report published about two months ago. So, so we see that uh, there is a very clear gender gap. Yeah? Um, we see this, this is uh, something that we see across uh, the entire South Asian region. Um, and we see that there's scope for improvement. Now, apart from uh, things like mobile phone ownership or access to the internet, one, one thing that uh, we do not see much in the data at this moment is data on more advanced uh, matrices. So this includes um, matrices such as uh, skills, entrepreneurship and leadership uh, in the digital economy. So for example, um, do we have data on female representation in the management levels of tech companies? So um, what I can say based on a, a research for this presentation is that at this moment for Pakistan, we see that um, these matrices, uh, we do not have such data. There was uh, some data from ILO stat uh, on female share in telecommunications and female share in computer programming, consultancy and related activities. Um, unfortunately, I'm not actually putting out the, the figures here because uh, even in the ILO data, it has been marked as uh, unreliable, uh, just those specific cells. But a quick calculation does go to show that um, Pakistan's uh, female share in, let's say, computer programming, consultancy and related activities, we are looking at about only 14%. Yeah, so 14% are females, basically. And when we compare it with another sub-region, such as ASEAN, uh, we are comparing with uh, something like Cambodia, which is 18%, and uh, that's the worst performing uh, country. So we are looking at a share of 18% uh, for, for a place like Cambodia, uh, as compared to, say, 14%. Um, with regards to the female share in computer programming consultancy and related activities. Uh, this is ILO stat data. And as I flagged, uh, they did say uh, that the data for that cell is might not be fully reliable. Maybe there are some outliers or something like that. Okay, uh, next slide, please. So looking at uh, the fact that there are uh, some clear gaps, both in terms of gender gaps and also data gaps, um, you know, what are some things that uh, perhaps uh, the governments and the think tanks could do. Now, uh, the first most important thing or most important approach to understand uh, with regards to uh, the inclusion of uh, women and girls in digitalization is that uh, there is a need to undertake a whole of government and a multi-sectoral approach. This cannot be the job of just uh, the ministry in charge of uh, digital trade or industrial development neither can it be the job of the Ministry of Women. Because in order to have uh, you know, effective policy, we need to involve you know, the education ministry, the ministry in charge of digitalization of services, uh, trade, industrial development, and of course, the Ministry of Women. So that's, I think, the most important uh, thing 
uh, to note and also uh, for, for, for there to be some political commitment, you know, that there needs to be such an approach. Then uh, another suggestion would be to actually integrate gender perspective. Uh, in policy planning uh, related to the digital economy. So just now, uh, the speaker before me, uh, Ms. Rabia, she did uh, list uh, a series of strategies and policies, for example, on e-trade, uh, on digital uh, Pakistan. Um, so perhaps what could be done is uh, to take a look at whether there could be an addendum gender strategy uh, to these policy documents, or if you know, there's going to be an upcoming uh, five-year plan on, on this topic, then to ensure that um, basically that gender perspectives are integrated. So basically it's important to have a coherent strategy to integrate gender perspectives into policy planning on digitalization. Then uh, the third part, I think it's obvious to all of us, uh, which is uh, to ensure capacity building among women. Um, when we talk about digital skills, of course, it's a very huge range, right? We are talking about uh, something very basic, such as uh, digital literacy, right? And, and ensuring that women know how to um, go online to open bank accounts or to access their bank accounts uh, to something like training uh, entrepreneurs to use uh, e-commerce to even more advanced things so, uh, like ensuring that uh, there's quality tertiary education uh, in, tech, in tech that is, uh, that is sort of uh, gender responsive. So, so when we talk about equipping women with digital skills, I think we have to look at uh, the large spectrum and of course then to prioritize and sequence depending on the country context of Pakistan. Uh, next then, uh, one of the other thing that could be done would be to uh, develop digital platforms uh, that target female entrepreneurs. So um, there are some reports done uh, in Southeast Asia um, on uh, how actually you know we could make digital platforms more friendly for female entrepreneurs. Now, um, although these are uh, reports on Southeast Asia, I think uh, the, the recommendations are actually uh, highly relevant as well um, to South Asia and to Pakistan. So um, these include things like, you know, on these digital platforms to ensure that the disaggregated, sex disaggregated data on sellers are collected. Um, it includes monitoring seller preferences and also seller performance by gender to be able to provide additional uh, support to these uh, sellers. Uh, when required. Um, one interesting suggestion was actually platform-sponsored financing, given that uh, women entrepreneurs sometimes have uh, difficulty assessing finance uh, and also being intentional in actually uh, raising awareness of these types of financing to both uh, female and male sellers. And of course, uh, there are things also such as uh, perhaps organizing training and networking among uh, female entrepreneurs who are using these e-platforms so that the uh, female entrepreneurs can really capitalize on the digital platforms uh, you know, to do their businesses. Um, finally, this is something uh, that I think was mentioned at the very start of um, this discussion, this panel discussion um, on ensuring sort of a digital security. So it would be very important um, to ensure that digital spaces are safe for women um, because there was a recent uh, World Bank study covering Bangladesh, India, and Pakistan, where over 70% of sampled women uh, expressed that they had experienced uh, online abuse. And um, one of the most important things is that we have to prevent online harassment. Uh, otherwise, you know, there would, this would pose as a serious barrier for women participating in the digital economy. Now, uh, finally, uh, my last slide, which is, uh, you know, what can SCAP offer? So it's basically um, an advertisement, um, maybe, maybe a little bit upwards. Yes. Okay, so um, let me do some advertisement as uh, I think we are very committed uh, to supporting Pakistan, um, you know, in its, uh, in its journey to actually um, include women in the digital economy. So right now, um, I think um, most of you might be aware that uh, our office actually has a, a comprehensive capacity building program for women-led uh, small medium enterprises in South Asia. Um, as of now, more than 1,200 
South Asian women entrepreneurs have been trained, including 138 from Pakistan. And, you know, we'll be very happy if, you know, you could help spread the word so that uh, we have more participants uh, from Pakistan. So um, this co uh, comprehensive capacity building program, it's very hands-on. It gives uh, women uh, some of the training and skills on how to actually use e-commerce. And there's also um, an online platform where they can actually try on how to use it. And there are also Facebook and WhatsApp groups uh, in order to, you know, if they require support. And, and we have seen actually uh, women networks, informal networks uh, being formed as a result of uh, this program. And, you know, they're advertising and selling stuff uh, to one another as well as to the broader community. So uh, we we'll really encourage uh, you to let any um, aspiring female entrepreneur know about uh, this capacity building initiative. May I request um, to wrap up in the interest of time? Yes, okay, and then uh, just uh, final two points. Um, so then we are also going to have some upcoming work on the unpaid care economy uh, in South Asia because we know that the you know, unpaid care burdens uh, is something that mm. Uh, actually impedes female participation in the labor force as well as uh, in education. So um, this uh, work on the unpaid care economy, this research, um, we would also be doing some research uh, in Pakistan, hopefully, and we, we hope to also engage uh, all of you in this. And okay. finally, let me uh, make the point that uh, ASCAP, we stand ready to support the government of Pakistan um, in integrating gender perspectives into its policies and programs of promoting digital uh, inclusion. So please let us know um, if you, know, you require any technical assistance or any type of partnership. Yeah, um, so that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, look forward to more discussion later. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Ms. Chu, for raising an important topic. Uh, as an economic policy person, I think one of the binding constraints to growth uh, in Pakistan and many countries is that we have ignored a very large segment of population to participate in the formal and informal economy. And one needs very strong you know, uh, 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 policy interventions and investments uh, to bring them on board. I'm not too sure where the number of 7% of GDP growth came from, but I can imagine that it's a significant contribution can be put in uh, uh, if you know, gradually the women workforce comes in and digital technology can play a role. So with that, we move to our next panelist, and I understand that's Dr. Arslan Khalid uh, speaking about uh, the topic is linked to, just let me reread it. In fact, he can explain himself. It's about the trade, e-commerce, and uh, opportunities, the model for better, you know, employment opportunities, Dr. Arslan Khalid. Dr. Arslan Tariq Rana. Uh, Gee, apologies, apologies for taking the wrong name. It's okay. Uh, thank you very much for uh, taking time for the presentation. Uh, I would just like uh, uh, to have a presentation uh, shared over here, please, so that I can start. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, so, so the topic uh, today I'm, I'm going to talk about is the social clauses, the, the sort of provisions related to the labor standards in free trade agreements. Uh, well, uh, we we wanted to uh, see the effects, whether they do have an effect on improving labor standards in respective developing economies or not. So uh, first, uh, um, there would be an introduction uh, to the topic, and then the structure is as follows that uh, uh, I would show the different aspects of trade and labor standards, and then there would be a methodology, and finally, we would uh, show the results and the conclusion. So next slide, please. Uh, Mainly, uh, mainly uh, uh, traditionally, we have uh, seen that trade is liberalized from uh, through the international institutions such as GATT, WTO. Uh, but uh, recently, and uh, uh, post in the post 1990s era, the regional trade agreements have been uh, really an efficient tool for, for improving trade. Well, now nowadays they are not only there to increase trade, but they are also used as a tool for domestic policy reforms in the developing countries. And uh, the labor clauses is one of them. Uh, labor clauses are used uh, actually to improve the labor standards in uh, the developing countries. And mostly it is uh, the, the developing countries when they do sign the trade agreement with the developed country, the developed country uh, incorporates 
the negotiations of labor standards into the trade agreement. Well, uh, what we uh, analyze over here that the labor social clauses uh, in all agreements are not the same. Actually, there exists a strong heterogeneity among those clauses. Some clauses are merely uh, political commitments, while the others are actually purely, uh, they contain the entire strong uh, enforceability, legal enforceability of the commitments. So we need to disentangle their effects and see whether which type of policy issue is most uh, reliable in case of uh, improving labor standards. Uh, uh, so there are some uh, uh, restrictive measures to trade as well as sanctions if the countries are not um, uh, following the commitments and, and derogating from the commitments. So next please, uh, the introduction uh, <clears throat> continue. Well, we examine 332 RTAs, regional trade, trade agreements, uh, as well as bilateral within them, uh, enforced between 58, 1958 and 2014. The econometric approach of difference in different difference uh, is used as it is used mostly in policy areas when we uh, want to see the effect of policy on uh, a specific issue. Endogeneity selectivity issue has been taken into account. I'm, I'm not going into much details about the technical details about this issue, but generally the selectivity issue we have also taken into account. And finally, we have uh, seen the effects of uh, labor incorporation of labor standards into the regional trade agreements um, on the labor standards. Um, so uh, next slide, please. So, so traditionally, what we have seen that uh, uh, at the WTO, ILO, and uh, other type of organizations. There have been uh, uh, efforts to include labor standards, but it was not so effective. Uh, so, uh, and, and how it used to do, how they used to do, they actually linked up. This is what we call issue policy issue linkage. They linked the trade policy with the labor practices. If the labor practices are going fine, then there won't be any sort of uh, retaliation from the developed countries towards the developing countries regarding labor. However, uh, many believe that uh, these measures are actually driven by protectionist measures. Um, uh, so so th this, uh, th this is the literature, this is what the literature tells us about uh, the, the trade and, and labor standards. How do, do the countries retaliate in the form of trade? Uh, and the other uh, slide please, the next uh, issue is actually regarding the incorporation social incorporation of social policies in trade arrangements so it has been you know the european union us gsps have been used for this purpose wto also includes some labor provisions uh, for the trade purposes as well as international labor organizations specifically there for labor uh, issues however there are questions about their effectiveness uh, at the multilateral level, uh, we have uh, seen the authors have have questioned it, and uh, there are not any significant effects found there. So uh, the developed countries have found another tool, which we can say that the, the tool of regional trade agreements, in which they incorporate labor standards, and uh, they are compelling the developing countries, you know, which is good in a sense, to. Uh, to 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 respect the labor uh, rights, labor standards, uh, and this is the another you know channel through which the the, the labor standards are being followed. Uh, so uh, the next step is uh, numerous researchers have analyzed of these uh, labor protection uh, protection provisions uh, and uh, the institutional mechanisms. What we have seen, uh, what we have observed that before analyzing the effects, we have to take into account these strong heterogeneity. They are actually, they exhibit different types of clauses. Some clauses include only, uh, only commitments related to the sort of memorandum of understanding, not more than that. Uh, but the others entail a strong uh, uh, retaliatory mechanism, strong institutional mechanisms that if in the, in the event of any derogation from uh, the labor commitments, uh, you can be penalized, you can be, um, you know, there would be a strong action against you. So these type of clauses, these type of agreements are segregated according to the institutional level they entail. Okay. Uh, so next slide, please. There, I would like to show you some uh, descriptive statistics. Uh, 
Uh, here, uh, more than uh, among 332 PTAs, uh, RTAs, 332, we have uh, analyzed that 93 of uh, trade agreements uh, contain only labor clauses that contain uh, any type of labor provisions without any sort of, you know, taking into account the institutional heterogeneity. However, among them, the medium level of legalism, which we uh, code it as legal enforceable trade agreements, they are uh, not more than 50 actually. And among them, again, there are very less agreements, around 17 agreements, which entail strong cooperation mechanisms as well as distribute dispute settlement mechanisms. So these three types of PTS, we would like to see the effects. So uh, next slide, please. The next, next one, please. Yes. Uh, just a glimpse of uh, the trade agreements. I know the, the previous one, please. Uh, the glimpse of uh, the, the the international powers which have uh, you know uh, signed the trade agreements. The, the previous one, please. The previous slide, please. Yes, this one. Thank you. So you can see over here the European Union has signed. Uh, 26 agreements which contain labor clauses. However, among them, only half of them uh, are medium, contain quasi judicial commitments, medium level of uh, agreements, and medium level of enforceability. And the DSM, only three. So, they, which we, what, what that we call over here for European Union is that there is a legal inflation. Uh, and and the, the agreements signed by US are quite, you know, uh, contain more dispute settlement mechanisms than any other areas like Chile, Canada, New Zealand, only one agreement among eight, eight and five that, that contain dispute settlement mechanisms. So the trend to incorporate dispute settlement mechanisms is quite, or, or you can say judicial mechanism is quite low. However, it is, it is increasing by time. So now in the next slide, we would like to show you the methodology. And in the methodology, I would just like to explain one more thing. Uh, the ne next slide, please. Yes, thank you. Um, I may interrupt. The analysis. I have a couple yes, of please. two minutes left for your presentation yes, because yes. Uh, we are running yes, short of yes, time. Yes, I, I, I'm finishing. This is what we have uh, analyzed. On there are two dimensions. Uh, the, the, due, uh, the, the due dimension and de facto dimension, ratification of ILO conventions by the countries and violations. So I would just like to show you the results as we have not much time left. In the results, the interesting things we are found, we have found, uh, please uh, move forward the slides. Another, another one, please. The results. Yeah, this one. Uh, mainly uh, the agreements which contain only area covered have no any effect. However, the medium level of legalism signed by the countries have effects on uh, signing at ILO, ILO conventions, labor, uh, labor conventions. But when we, the next slide please, when we include the dispute settlement mechanisms, yes, the next one please, yes, this one, thank you. Over here we have seen that at the de facto level, uh, the DSM provisions strongly and significantly reduce the labor violations. So what we conclude from our research is that if we take into account the heterogeneous, please stay, uh, make the conclusion slide available, the last one. Uh, over here, we can straightforwardly say that if we take into account the heterogeneous form of labor, in court, labor provision in trade agreements, we have found that merely political commitments don't have any effect on the signing of conventions at ILO, as well as the actual labor standards violation. However, if we include the strong and uh, strong cooperation, as well as dispute settlement mechanisms, they have strong negative effect. That is, they reduce strongly and significantly the labor violations. Uh, this is all from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Salan. Uh, important topic. Uh, the question would be in future that while negotiating the regional and preferential trade agreements, how can one incorporate the digitalization of trade and link it to labor standards in future? Because monitoring through GSPs and other conditions, as you are saying, is not necessarily, uh, you know, 
uh, uh, sufficient Effective. as we move yeah. forward. Yes. Well, thank you very much. So with that, you know, we come to our last but not the least, you know, speaker from Institute of Development Studies. So we have Dr. Uh, Krishnav Baga, and her topic is, let me read it because it was not given there. Mm -hmm. So let me read it again. So it's about the digital trade policies for inclusive development in Pakistan, lessons from South-South trade agreements. So looking forward to hearing from Dr. Krishnav. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And thanks to SDPI as well for giving me the opportunity to participate in this excellent panel. Um, in the interest of time, I think I'll just keep my presentation short and share the key messages um, of the presentation. So uh, Mr. Parvez very nicely pointed out the COVID, uh, the di digital divide that exists between developing countries and developed countries. I just like to stress that uh, COVID-19 has actually widened this digital divide. Uh, so you see that there is a positive demand shock to digital connectivity with people working from home, businesses shifting online, particularly through fixed broadband. But this positive demand is mainly sort of absorbed by developed countries with their larger capacities and more robust internet networks. Whereas in developing countries, the fixed broadband access, re access remains quite low. And the surge in internet demand is largely met through um, decline in broadband speeds. So if you look here in this slide, um, I've just, um, so this shows the average broadband speed of developing and developed countries in the lockdown periods and then how the change has occurred post uh, pre-lockdown. So here you can see that in many developing countries, firstly, the average speed is quite low, uh, which is an Mbps. And you also see negative changes, right? For Bangladesh, India, Nepal, for instance, the broadband speeds have declined during uh, the lockdown. And here you can see Pakistan as well, that although there has not been a decline in broadband speeds, the average speed during the lockdown was quite low. So sort of to say that, you know, this digital divide has actually widened, um, you know, uh, during the pandemic. And uh, despite the fact that, you know, developing countries are facing these specific challenges, we see that the global digital trade narrative is heavily shaped by the developed country agenda or perspective. So if you look here, uh, we find that the ICT lobbying uh, in the US has, uh, you know, increasingly shot up in the last uh, 20 years or so. And um, it's, it's reaching almost 80 million US dollars uh, in just last year. And uh, the expenditures by the likes of Facebook and Amazon on lobbying in the ICT sector has actually doubled in just the last five years. And uh, these issues have expanded beyond domestic agreements to international trade agreements. And these companies are essentially seeking free cross-border data flows, um, you know, bans on any sort of data localization, bans on source code sharing, as well as bans on imposition of any sort of custom duties on electronically transmitted products. Uh, but no consensus really has been reached at the multilateral level. Um, and as the speaker before me mentioned, so this, this sort of agenda is largely being pushed forward through bilateral and regional trade agreements. So it's really important to understand what is happening in these smaller settings as well, because they're likely to influence uh, future um, arrangements and agreements uh, as well. And here, I think understanding what is happening in South-South trade agreements is particularly interesting because these, com these countries have very similar contextual issues, political challenges, as well as innovation constraints. So how these countries are trading uh, in terms of digitalization and e-commerce, I think, offers an important uh, and interesting perspective. So when we look at the e-commerce uh, negotiations and issues uh, in these regional trade agreements, uh, the first sort of point of contention that has emerged is how to classify e-commerce. So if you classify these goods, um, these e-commerce as uh, electronically transmitted goods, then they would be subject to the GATT agreement, the General Agreement on Trade and Tariff. If they're classified as services, they would be subjected to the GATT's rules. And then even under GATT's, you have subsectoral commitments, right? So whether should they should be subjected to telecommunications versus audiovisual rules and so on. And we see that in the South-South trading agreements, uh, largely the approach that has been taken is that to include e-commerce as a separate chapter in itself. So this allows these countries to not uh, take any explicit position on defining e-commerce. And we find that around 32% uh, you know, of the South-South trade agreements have a provision of e-commerce in their uh, chapters, um, but 20% have a separate e-commerce chapters, which is how they deal with it. Second is understanding the scope of e-commerce that uh, e-commerce also connects to sort of analog challenges related to postal competence, 
uh, competition laws, intellectual property, and so on. And these link to other protocols and trade agreements as well, such as trade in goods, trade in services, and to make those necessary linkages. And the third sort of issues emerge around the depth of commitments. So should you take sort of hard binding uh, legal in, legally enforceable commitments or more sort of soft endeavors or best endeavor commitments? And here we find that in South-South trade agreements, there is a very clear preference emerging for facilitation provisions such as cooperation. So it's a lot more softer language in these trading agreements in terms of promoting a certain objective or recognizing the importance of a certain objective. And so here I've listed just the, uh, this chart to show which are the top most common provisions, digital trade provisions emerging in South-South trade agreements. And uh, the top most provision that we find is around data protection. The second is around uh, digital trade facilitation, particularly around electronic authentication, signatures and digital certificates. And the third most important provision is around consumer protection, which was also mentioned by uh, Ms. Rabia in her presentation. Um, as one of the key uh, sort of um, challenges that need to be addressed in these agreements. Interestingly, if you look at the bottom of the chart, we find that there is no trade agreement, uh, you know, requiring source code, a uh, banning source code transfer. And these sort of laws around cross-border data flows, national treatment in e-commerce and banning data localization are not that common when Southern countries trade with each other. With each other. So just looking at sort of data protection and privacy, uh, which was the most common digital trade provision, uh, we find that typically it is uh, a provision related to the protection of personal data or data privacy that emerges in most of these trade agreements. And uh, essentially these commitments are soft or mixed commitments. So 7% of these commitments are soft, while 15% are mixed commitments uh, in the form that they are allowing for something that is not explicitly mentioned. So for instance, if you look at the Brazil and Chile FTA, uh, they allow for cooperation activities on data cooperation or data protection through information sharing. So they allow a bit of flexibility uh, in the trading agreement as well. And only 2% are actually hard commitments that legally bind countries uh, to, to, to do that. Um, and here we're increasingly seeing that data protection authorities are becoming very important for this sort of legislative framework to work. And Pakistan in the sort of draft e-commerce bill already has mentioned the creation of such an authority. But the key challenges here to address in the future would be related to independence of such an authority, institutional capacity and linkages with sort of other um, authorities, uh, enforcement of laws as well as financial constraints, which are emerging as the challenges faced by data protection authorities in other countries as well. And uh, the second provision that we spoke about was digital trade facilitation, so introduction of e-signatures, um, and so on. And here it's interesting to note that a lot of these trade agreements have specific and targeted provisions for SMEs to facilitate e-commerce, um, e-trade for SMEs and for women uh, sellers. Uh, when we speak about cross-border data flows, um, I think the big debate here is looking at data localization. So you have private sector firms arguing that any sort of data localization policies in countries or in Pakistan, for instance, will increase their cost of doing business in Pakistan and will increase the compliance cost of these com companies. And therefore, they should not have data localization in place. But the argument that is made at the WTO by many developing countries is that they need to protect their legitimate uh, capacity uh, to restrict the flows um, of their own citizens' data whether it is for uh, national security reasons or government surveillance reasons or even economic reasons. Because there is some evidence also showing that data localization policies can encourage foreign direct investment and encourage these foreign firms to set up data centers locally and bring in the sort of um, you know, technology transfer and skill transfer through the setting up of these data centers within the domestic borders. And uh, some examples of countries already following this is China, Russia, Indonesia, Brazil, Nigeria, and South Korea. So they already have data localization policies in place. Um, and this is kind of echoed in South-South trade agreements. So you find that only 12% of South-South trade agreements have um, a policy allowing for free cross-border flow of data, and only 8% are banning data localization. But more broadly, this is not the most common approach. And there's a clear shift towards building national digital capacities, data processing capacities um, in these South-South countries. Uh, and just before I conclude, I think there are also some cross-cutting issues that are very important, uh, as I was mentioning, around consumer protection. So this is absolutely critical to build digital trust and online consumer trust for uh, consumers of e-commerce. 
Uh, but interestingly enough here, you see that in 83% of the South-South trade agreements, there is some sort of a dispute uh, settlement mechanism, but this excludes e-commerce provisions. And in some of these agreements, if you look at the Chile-China FTA, it actually explicitly excludes e-commerce. Uh, so the North-South RTAs tend to have a lot more stronger interest in enforceable commitments and consumer protection than South-South. And largely the reasons behind this is political. Uh, because these, these countries are coming in with you know, varied colonial pasts and they have sovereignty-based constraints. Um, and as a result, they tend to have uh, softer commitments in consumer protection. And lastly, the point on source code sharing, I think is very interesting that there's absolutely no South-South trade agreement which uh, bans countries from asking or uh, accessing these source codes or the transfer of these source codes. And I think this is very important because traditionally developing countries have been, so to say, latecomers in the digital space or tech space and are usually been the ones that are acquiring the technologies. So for them, tech transfer is a very important pathway of, of doing that. And uh, this can be particularly important, I think, for kind of stopping these sort of algorithmic biases you're seeing that are coming up. Uh, so for instance, a couple of years ago, we saw that Amazon's buy box algorithm was uh, biasing or marking down women sellers in these global digital marketplaces. And so having access or retaining policy space to ask that sort of source code I think is quite critical in combating these challenges. And uh, so just in the interest of time, uh, my last slide concluding some of the key points is that, so we need to have a digital trade policy in developing countries that sits within the wider industrial policy context of the country or the industrialization strategy. So it needs to speak to the FDI policy, for instance, or the education policy or the science and technology policy, because the challenges of digital trade are both digital and anal analog. Uh, the second is that there is a need to address issues around data protection and privacy, digital trade facilitation and consumer protection, which we see are the top three challenges emerging in South-South trade. Um, it's important to have specific and targeted provisions for MSMEs and women because the challenges they face are very different. Um, lastly, there is a need to prioritize capacity building, particularly around data collection, data storage and data processing, so that the firms in Pakistan are actually able to upgrade in, in these value chains through use of digital technologies and data capacities. And lastly, I think there's a lot, lot of space there to explore sector specific policies and cross border data flows. So the regulators are able to retain control of data pertaining to critical sectors such as finance or health, uh, while at the same time having uh, the flexibility of exchanging data in certain sectors mm -hmm. to license entities in exchange of market access, for instance. Uh, so with that, I'd just like to conclude. I think it was a bit fast, but I think I just wanted to also give some time for a uh, question and answer. So thank you. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Krishma Manga. Wonderful overview of the regulatory space and the issues. Uh, one of the things that you mentioned that actual, you know, the internet speed and capacity has not increased is perhaps because in COVID, uh, it put countries under huge fiscal constraint. So the adequate you know, investments could not be made at that point in time, but there's a realization. So we have around 10 to 12 minutes time for questions and answer. We started a bit late. Uh, so uh, I would appreciate if you, we could take two to three questions uh, and club them and then pass it on to the speakers. So, I, uh, so how would the questions be collated? Would that be through comments? So over to administrators to uh, uh, guide us. Sir, I have just received one question, which is regarding protection of consumer rights and uh, data protection. So uh, the, the the person is asking about how we can ensure uh, these two issues in digital era in Pakistan, either the FIA and other government related institute are sufficient enough uh, in their capacity to protect these rights, or we need to have a separate body uh, to be formed to protect these issues. Okay, so over to our panelists, but I have one comment that creating regulatory bodies is easier, but actually giving them know-how how to do things is the real challenge. So what happens in the context of Pakistan and many other countries is that we blindly follow and set up regulatory structures, but then these structures actually create perverse incentives because they themselves don't understand what they're supposed to do. So open to Karishma and Rabia and you know any other panelists to comment on that. Uh, 
uh, yeah, I can take that quickly. I think, uh, and you're absolutely right in mentioning that. I think there's some sort of this extrapolation which goes on from you know what what is happening in the northern countries and the the approaches that they're taken, and then sort of extrapolating that to the southern context. But that doesn't work, and that is quite clear because uh, you see that a lot of the main challenge in these developing countries is not the sort of absence of you know awareness of these data laws or data frameworks, but actually the implementation of these laws through data regulators. And uh, so it's not just about creating those sort of institutional bodies, but actually making sure that they work, right? And they're not fragmented in their approach and they're actually sitting within the larger political economy understanding of the, the digital sector and how they work and operate with other institutions. So I think, um, so I would refrain from sort of extrapolating that from the, the Northern context. Um, another interesting point around consumer protection and perhaps a suggestion is to look at this concept of trust marks. So we saw that in, in, in the case of South Africa, for instance, there was you know, challenges emerging around which websites or which e-commerce websites to trust um, and which tr uh, sellers to trust. And then they engaged in something called this electronic badge of trust or uh, trust marks. Uh, where um, I think which was sort of supported by the European Union, U European Union, I think, but that really helped to kind of build the trust of the you know wider consumer community. Uh, so I think that's perhaps an interesting approach as well to explore in the case of Pakistan, okay. where the, these sort of digital certificates and trust marks can work. Any other comments from our panelists, uh, 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 Pervez Sab or Rabia or anybody? Yeah, if I may, I I actually have a question from the a representative from UN NSCAP. Uh, it was mentioned that uh, SCAP has trained 1,200 1, South Asian women, out of which only 138 were from Pakistan. Uh, could you please elaborate on why is the number is so low and what can be done to increase it? Okay, uh, thank you, sir, for the question. Well, um, so basically how we actually disseminate, we disseminate it to some of the chambers of commerce and through our networks. So what could have happened is that uh, perhaps there's less awareness uh, on the part of uh, Pakistani women entrepreneurs. So I think it's a very straightforward, uh, there's a very straightforward way of uh, improving uh, the participation, which is uh, perhaps, um, you know, offline after this conference, if, if uh, you could also recommend uh, some networks that we could perhaps uh, disseminate uh, the invitations to. Yes, we would be very, very happy uh, to actually have uh, more Pakistani participants. And also, um, one other option would, of course, be for us to also provide, it, uh, to pro provide targeted national level training uh, for Pakistani women entrepreneurs. In fact, uh, as we are speaking now, um, actually, uh, another of my colleagues is uh, giving some training to uh, Nepalese officials on this topic. So um, actually, you know, if uh, there is a demand, we can also uh, do country level and local level training. Yes, for Pakistan. Thank you very much. Um, As for the my general, take would be if the Khatsab to look at it, yes. like we rightly pointed out that if you could expand the networks from traditional chambers of commerces to specialized bodies, so that message can go, but at the end of the day, developing countries and other countries have to create your own setups of training here in DigiDC to scale it because UNSCAP has a limited capability, but they have knowledge of other countries. So if we can set up something here and you know strengthen it through partnerships, that will be the way forward, in my opinion. I, I fully agree with you. Uh, we have to set up our own. Uh, only that if 1,200 women were trained in South Asia, uh, if coming from countries like ours, <laughs> why is it that we are we are so less? Uh, and uh, as far other channels, yes, chambers of commerce, uh, very right, uh, Sahib. Also, the incubation centers. Now we have yeah. uh, incubation centers in the public as well as private sector. In fact, every university, almost every university in Pakistan, uh, mm -hmm. has got incubation centers. So they. There, women entrepreneurs uh, can be can be reached very easily. Absolutely, to mainstreams. Any other questions, uh, uh, Wes, from the yeah, just uh, a quick um, comment uh, regarding uh, ASCAP's uh, collaboration uh, um, in terms of uh, gender specific po uh, policy 
um, review. Uh, we would love to collaborate with ASCAP in that aspect. Uh, we recently collaborated with uh, IDS. Karishma Manga is very well aware of that. And we can expand that research uh, in collaboration with ASCAP. So we are more open to this collaboration, definitely. Okay, but any other general questions of us from the people or we can ask the participants to generate some final comments before we close. I think uh, there is no such question, but only one comment from Ahmed Qadir. He just mentioned that the National Data Protection Authority is under invasion under the Personal Data Protection Bill, which is currently drafted and pending in Parliament for approval. Now that I have seen, uh, as, as we discussed, that these authorities, at least conceiving those is not a bad thing, but actual, you know, the taste of the pudding is in eating that these, do we have the wherewithal? What happens is that most of these authorities are captured by same bureaucrats who are generalists and really don't understand uh, uh, the dynamics of this change. That's where private sector has to come in through self-regulatory, I think, uh, uh, structures so that people have confidence, particularly women, to enter into digital space uh, because expecting state to build that you know, quickly is perhaps asking a bit too far. Uh, so with that, if we don't have any questions, I would like to thank the speakers for covering wide ranging topics linked to the emerging digital economy in the post COVID world. Uh, there were very useful data sets which were used to actually you know, impress us that what's actually happening and you know, the preparedness of the government, the issues of you know, labor standards, data protection, also the issues of you know, gender mainstreaming. I think these are all critical. My only one sentence here is uh, that we need to sequence it in a manner that you know, this is sustained, uh, a developed approach towards uh, a very uh, you know, clear targets rather than just having a facilitative approach because states uh, don't tend to use these things uh, 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 to make themselves accountable. It's more of uh, the giving side of the state. So we need to look at digitalization in a manner that state has targets and performance orientation and private sector should demand that. Uh, so with that, I would once again thank SDPI for giving opportunity to me for learning and to participants for contribution. Uh, uh, I hope that more research will emerge in this area uh, to help us formulate our thinking better how to move forward. Thank you very much, everybody, and very kind of you. All the best. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Yeah. Goodbye.